store, nurtured in love and conscience refined, with body and spirit united once more. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then, gather in hope, compassion, and strength, gather to celebrate once again. Welcome to the home of Unitarian Universalism in Bismarck, Mandan. In our Unitarian Universalist community, we celebrate diversity of beliefs and we are guided by seven principles, which are printed on the, your order of service and can be found on our website. As we gather this morning, we acknowledge that we are in a place with a long history. We are in a place to which Nueta, Hidatsa, Sanish, Dakota, Lakota, Tsitsitsa, Matisse, and Anishinaabe peoples all claim belonging, connection, and deep knowledge. In recognizing all our relatives here, human and more than human, may we honor who and where we are today and find our way to be in right relationship here. This congregation is a place where we gather to nurture one another, to be supported on our life journey, and to put our beliefs into action through work in our communities and the wider world. My name is Angela Dagman. I'm the office manager here at the UU, and I will be facilitating this morning's service. Let us join in a spirit of meditation, reflection, or prayer as we deepen into our service and share our opening words for this morning. This poem is entitled Invitation by Shel Silverstein. If you are a dreamer, come in. If you are a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, or a magic bean buyer. If you're a pretender, come sit by my fire, for we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in, come in. We, we join Unitarians and Unitarian Universalists all over the world in lighting our chalice. Would Karen Faye please come up to light the chalice, which is a symbol of the spark of life in each of us. If you are on Zoom and have your chalice with you, I invite you to turn on your video to share while we light them. We are in good company. Our chalice lighting words are by Reverend Linda White. A flame casts both light and shadow into the world and we choose that which beckons us. For good or in fear, we approach the edge of mystery, the threshold of possibility, or the depths of love. It is all light and shadow, and we are the witnesses.
For our program this morning, we are sharing a sermon from Reverend Sharon Dittmar that was recorded last month as part of the Mid-America Region Sermon of the Month program. Reverend Dittmar graduated from Harvard Divinity School in 1997. She served one year as interim minister at the gathering at Northern Hills and 18 years as minister at First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati. In 2016, she would began work as Congressional Life Field staff with the Mid-America Re Region. Her sermon is entitled, Married to Amazement, and Reverend Dittmar writes that she was called to this topic from a line in a Mary Oliver poem. I will read that poem, and it is an excellent poem, but I do want to make a note um, that the language is gendered. So I invite you guys, I invite everyone to edit um, it for yourself in the most meaningful, supportive, and celebratory way possible. When Death Comes by Mary Oliver. When death comes like a hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut. When death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and a singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, toward silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life, I was, a bride, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the whole world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. I chose to marry amazement. I chose other ideas first. I actually tried preparing for the worst. That's an oldie and goodie from my childhood. Interestingly though, it didn't protect me from what could and did go wrong. Turns out I really wasn't imaginative enough. Beyond that, it was truly exhausting and depressing remaining vigilant, focused on doomed potential futures. After I went through this phase, I actually tried denial for a while and, and that got me into flat out trouble, not attending to the obvious and the necessary. Much later in life, I chose a middle way that I keep to this day. Aware of the valley of loss and pain on one side, which is always with us, and every gift and opportunity on the other, also with us. Then between them rests a middle way, a chosen path of present wonder, amazement, and gratitude. I served for, as a parish minister for 19 years and something that I learned is as the great Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel said in his Yom Kippur essay, Quote, scratch the skin of any person and you come across sorrow, frustration, unhappiness. People are pretentious. Everybody looks proud inside. He is heartbroken. From the inside seat of parish ministry, I watched apparently successful members and their families struggle with life-threatening illnesses, addiction, affairs financial distress and sometimes ruin, traumatic injury and accidents, dementia, death, even the death of children before the parents, something which I will just never understand. It all can happen 
I have been with people as it all has happened. And it was from this seat with them as they, as my teachers, that I learned I could never prepare for all the possibilities, nor know which ones to expect when, if ever, might become part of my personal story. Early in my ministry, I visited an older couple in the hospital. You must imagine baby minister me, 30 years old, no gray hair, not yet ordained, and a chaplain residency program in Boston, Massachusetts. The woman said to me, looking at her dying husband, how could this happen to us? We were missionaries. I remember simultaneously realizing death is inevitable and uncontrollable, a hungry bear in autumn, and that no good works nor beneficial God offers immortality in this life. I also realized looking into her grieving face that there was nothing for me to say other than, I am sorry, this must be very hard for you. Bad things happen to good people and wonderful things happen to people who behave very badly. From this, I have concluded that neither I nor anyone else is fully in control. Rather, we are in a river of life and there are floods and droughts and lazy days and seasonal changes. We can put up some guardrails, things like life insurance, health insurance. We can write wills. We can ask for help as often as we need it, even to the quote annoyance of others, whether they be financial advisors or medical providers or therapists or just family members. But when the lights go out, when the hungry bear comes, we will not have prepared for everything. Attempting to be fully prepared is exhausting. It requires constant depressing vigilance, imagining future harms, and all that time spent in these thoughts separates us from the people and experiences present in this very day. It's a deadening way to live and a great way to ruin the possible now. A few years ago, I took part in a leadership program offered in my, uh, in my city. We were asked to do an exercise that I frankly hated. We were instructed to walk around to 30 people we had just met, look them in the eye and say either, I trust you or I don't trust you. I know neither the benefit nor the purpose of this exercise. And I certainly remember it's multiple cringeworthy moments. Beyond that though, and more importantly, I remember the response of one classmate. This classmate, the shortest man in the class, who lives in a world that values tallness, one who could be considered vulnerable given his size, who had to actually look up to everyone in the eye when he spoke, said, I trust you. When the instructor later asked him why he did this, he replied, it doesn't matter if I trust you. I trust myself. And I trust myself to figure it out. He changed the frame of the entire exercise to empower himself. Much later, I learned that he actually grew up as an immigrant in a biracial family amidst poverty and multiple challenges, and then made a series of mistakes like we all do. And he figured it out. He figured his way through. These days, he does not waste time remaining vigilant and worrying about the future. He chooses to name his frame and believes that when problems arise, he will figure them out. So he chooses to live loud and proud and have a lot of fun. It's a choice he makes based not on ignorance or denial, but knowledge, experience, and a commitment to the present. It's amazing to me in retrospect how one awkward exercise could teach me the importance of choosing my own frame. What I learned from all these teachers I just told you about is to love the now, to dig in deeply, to savor it, to make time for it and family and friends and fun, building community, living into my own joy, 
relishing the unique me that will not be replaced. When I became a minister, I used to see this quote by the writer and literature professor Joseph Campbell everywhere I turned, follow your bliss. If you were alive 30 years ago and reading, you might have seen it as well. I don't see this quote on walls so much anymore, if ever, but I think Campbell was on to something. In the words of theologian and civil rights leader Howard Thurman, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. What makes me come alive is wonder. And I find it in the present, the eternal now. When death comes, like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I wanna step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it gonna be like that cottage of darkness? And therefore I look upon everything as a sibling hood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea and I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each flower or each life as flower, a flower as common as a field daisy and a singular. In each name, a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does toward silence. And each body, a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was married to amazement. I took the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I've made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. I want to be married to amazement. I want to take the world in my arms. I don't want to simply visit the world. I wanna go out and submerge myself in its wonder. To do this, I must take one day at a time and live in the present, which as I've told you, is not easy for me. But here's something I learned from my colleague, Phil Lund. It's an exercise he taught me, a walking, moving exercise. So whenever I go out for a stroll, you could do it. Um, However, I consider these six things, sight, sound, smell, sense, sky, and stance. I look at my surroundings. I listen. I inhale deeply to smell. I feel the air on my skin, the sense. Is it humid or crisp or cold? I look at the sky. And I feel my body, my stance. If you try this exercise, please adapt it to whatever level of mobility and sensory function available to you. And that, of course, varies for all of us and will continue to vary throughout our lives. I used to walk with my head down, actually lost in thought. I watched my feet a lot, generally thinking about the past or future. But with this exercise, I am in the present. I smell rain in the air or the decaying earth that lets me know summer is ending. I experience the quality of the air. I see the leaves drop and bud and flower again in the spring. When walking with me, one needs to put up with my shouts of delight while I see things and hear and touch and smell and feel. I notice how my body feels. Is it stiff? Is it flexible? Is it uneven? I check my stance and sometimes I find out I'm limping and I think, why am I limping? And then I do like a body check. Where's my body in the present? And at least once on every walk, I look up at the sky. Is it a clear blue sky or a foggy sky? Is it overcast? 
or are there puffy evening clouds just letting in that last pink shaft of light? It's when I look at the sky that I'm filled with the most wonder and I think of what a gift it is to be alive and how everything changes and nothing is given. Every walk is a new discovery, a new adventure, even if it is on the same path. And I am reminded that every moment passes, every moment, the bad ones, the good ones, even the great ones. This has taught me to be more grateful than for what is and to remember. So honor, honor the now and give and receive love where I find it. I remind myself nothing is given and then reach out for what is now. I don't want to mislead you into thinking that because I choose wonder and the present, it is all wonderful all the time. I too have losses and grief. I worry about the state of American democracy and the war in Ukraine. I worry about deforestation and species extinction. I worry about armed rebels in the Democratic Republic of Congo and how we live in a country, America, that has chosen to incarcerate black, brown, and poor people. I worry about my spectacularly crabby, difficult, and failing mother. And while writing this sermon, actually in the midst of writing the sermon, I received a text from my sister letting me know someone very important to us had died. I too am scared. I too am heartbroken. 19th century essayist and philosopher Henry David Thoreau wrote about wanting to, quote, suck out all the marrow of life. Now, for him, this included living a quiet, somewhat self-reliant life. I, I don't want to delude you. He was into self-reliance, but he got a lot of help when he was living his quiet life on Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. My definition is a bit different than his. I encourage you to explore your own, but I understand wanting to suck the marrow out of life in my own chosen way. I recently watched a video by slam poet, Andrea Gibson. That's an older video. In it, they speak of going home with a woman and before their first kiss, the woman runs to get a stethoscope so that Andrea can hear the woman's heartbeat faster as they kiss story is just so beautiful to me. What a delightful way to suck the marrow out of life with one kiss. I want to hear it so closely. I want to hear how your heart beats faster when we kiss. It is so present to the moment, so simple, so possible, so blissful, so alive. Here's a tweet from Andrew and Gibson from just this past week. They say, awkwardness is my new drug of choice. Nothing gets me higher than uncomfortable situations. In today's newsletter, I wrote about how I've been on a mission to embarrass myself regularly. regularly. Have a beautifully awkward day, everyone. Heart emoji. Her newsletter from September 13th contains this story. Years ago on tour in Europe, my friends and I dared our friend Katie to walk through a crowded travel plaza with a 20 foot strand of toilet paper dragging from her shoe, complainly, complaining loudly in a deep Midwestern accent about how there was no place in the world good as America. She made a humiliating spectacle of herself. We were high on that embarrassment for days. There are just so many ways to live in wonder and bliss, to be high on embarrassment, laughter, to be alive as the world collides around us. I hope for each of us that we take care during the hard times and are present to our true feelings about it, and that we reach for the present wonder as often as possible, maybe even experiment with humiliating spectacle and awkwardness. Maybe be curious and find some wonder. However you do it, I hope you make it a great day.
May it always be so. It's a benediction here. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. in my soul.